Ready? Yep. What's up, fellow fantasy-loving friends? Josh with RSMP Tabletop here, along with... Eric. And today, we're going to talk about... We're going to be talking about the Inhumans. So, Eric is actually a long-time Inhumans player. How long have you been playing Inhumans? I've been playing Inhumans since I got into the game. Um, I am in love with Inhumans. Uh, I'm an OG fan, one would say. How long have you been playing? Uh, I've been playing basically for about two years now. Okay. Yeah. So... What are you going to talk about today about Inhumans? You're going to kind of give us the rundown of why you like them, why you play them, and how you've been doing with them? Yeah, so um, I'm going to go through all the models for the Inhumans. There's not many. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight models that are affiliated. Um, I'll talk about a couple splashes, and we'll talk about their three tactics cards. So very short, concise. Um, for all you Inhumans fans, this will be a great video for you. A great breakdown. I'll talk about some competitive plays as well. Um, and then for your non-Inhumans uh, fans, for, for the X-Men fans here, um, Josh, I don't know if you know this, but there's a long time feud between the X-Men and the Inhumans. I did not know. Yes. Um, there, was a, there was a point where they tried to replace the X-Men with the Inhumans. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Due to property reasons. So uh, we're not going to get into that, but um, I do want to say that uh, Inhumans are very fun. Um, if you're an X-Men player, they are, uh, the Black Bolt's leadership is very similar to Xavier's leadership. Um, the models are very fun. They have, their models have other affiliation splashes too. So, um, it, it's just a great affiliation to get into and to play and, uh, feel like you're playing 4D chess. We're good. I just never pressed record on that camera. Oh. But we don't need it until now anyway, so. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right, so we had talked about this a little bit earlier, and it's cool that we talk about characters and cards and things about the game, but I think what's important, and we've kind of missed on this before, but it's like, I want to know your thought process going into the game and why you've come to these conclusions. So I guess the question I have for you is like, you're getting ready to go play a tournament. Yeah. You're building your roster, you're picking your cards and all that stuff. What considerations are you like taking into that and how much of that goes into who you think you're going to be playing? Is it based on people you're going to be playing, affiliations you're going to be playing, or just talk to me a little bit about, a little bit about the process of how that works out for you. Yeah, so um, specifically in the context of Inhumans, right, um, I think Inhumans are a mid-range team, right? So in Marvel Crisis Protocol, you have teams that are more attrition-based, right? We, we've seen um, Asgard, we just did a video on Asgard, um, and then there are teams which are more scenario-based, like Web, Web Warriors. Uh, which are like the, you know, Miles Morales, uh, Peter Parker, and they're trying to win on turn three by points, right? Jin's dudes. Yeah, Jin's <laughs> dudes, exactly. So uh, Inhumans are a great mid-range team because they are a jack of all trades. They, uh, because of the flexibility of the leadership, um, and that leadership is basically, he allows them to pass one power from one model to another at any point um, in the turn and once per turn. Um, it allows us a lot of flexibility. So if we are up against a really uh, strong attrition team, we are then going to pivot into the scenario focus and play more of a, like a runaway, keep away game. And if um, we get paired up against a Web Warriors player, we know we have to shut their stuff down. Like we have to play aggressive. And so we bring some of those models as well. So uh, in humans, out of think, I think out of most affiliations is probably the most mid-range in the game just by nature of their leadership and uh, their models. Like we don't have the full inhuman royal family. We have a lot of weird characters like Quicksilver and Beast and um, Ronin, which are, uh, and Miss Marvel, which are affiliated with other teams typically, but form the basis of our affiliated team. All right. Um, so when you say mid-range, like when I think of mid-range, I think of Magic the Gathering and the deck Jund. So what that deck did was a little bit of everything. It didn't kill you the fastest. Yeah. It didn't have like anything crazy, but it just played good, strong, had a punch, and pretty much had somewhat of an answer for kind of everything. Is that what you mean when you say mid-range in regards to these guys too? Yeah, basically, they, they have an answer for everything. It's not the best answer. It's never going to be the best answer. Uh, we don't play the control game to bring it back into magic turns. We don't play the control game the strongest. We don't, uh, our character throws are very limited, right? We don't play the uh, attrition game um, because our models are very, um, they have low health points, a lot of our models. They're very squishy. Um, a lot of them are glass cannons, especially Medusa. So, um, and Miss Marvel. So that's sort of like, 
I think it fits that sort of archetype that you've brought up and um, that comparison as well. Because we, yeah, we're just kind of in the middle of the pack. But there are times in the meta when the mid time, uh, when the mid range shines. And um, we'll talk about that maybe in a future video about the meta about that's going on right now um, and about those considerations. But my point here is that Inhumans are always going to be relevant because they're always going to be in the middle of the pack and always on the upwards part of that pack just by the, the strength of their leader and uh, the strength of their uh, leadership as well. Okay, so you're getting ready to go play a tournament. Yeah. What's the first thing you consider? Is it your roster? Is it your tactics card? Well, obviously it's your affiliation, right? So you've determined you're going to play in humans. What's your next step after that? Yeah, so um, for me, um, I think it's really important to think about the people and the teams that you're going to expect to come up against. I think that's like, it's important to know that because that will shape the roster that you create. You can come up, you can co go to any event, you could bring your full affi affiliated team and you could still have a great time. But if you are trying to place well at that tournament and trying to um, counter the, the, the strong picks there, you always have to keep them in mind. So for me, I like to just think of um, the top models in the affiliation. I, I don't want to think about every model in the game, right? But I know like if I'm going to this tournament, I'm probably going to expect to see Namor. Like if we're talking about a tournament that happened recently. And so I need to have answers for that. Um, there's going to be a Web Warriors player. I know that. So um, I think oftentimes, not to go too much on a tangent, but oftentimes we as a Marvel Crisis Protocol players, um, we get down on ourselves and we think that certain models are kind of less useful than others. Um, and we just write them off. Like... We could be like, oh, well, Lockjaw doesn't have much mobility and he really is a one-trick pony dog. Um, and <laughs> he, I'm just not going to bring him because he sucks. He, he only does that. But I, I think we should instead think about, maybe we, th we should realize that maybe we think this way because of the opponents that we're consistently up against, right? And that should always shape the roster we're playing. So... Lockjaw has his uses, Beast and Quicksilver, they have their uses, but uh, maybe in different metas. So I'm thinking about that all the time when I enter into a tournament. It's kind of a complicated way to put that, but, um, and you're not always going to know the opponents you're facing either, but just to have an idea of the models that you might be, might be facing. Okay. Now, with that being said, going forward, like you're, you're getting ready to go for the tournament. Mm -hmm. Is there a model or models that are just guaranteed, you know, you're playing these guys, snap, taking it. They're probably hitting the table multiple times throughout this tournament. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, in the humans roster, I only bring four of them actually. Um, and so the, 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 those four are the first one is Black Bolt because he's the leader. I have to bring him. Great model. Medusa is also another model. She is the true ruler of uh, Atalon. That is the, the home of uh, the Inhumans on the moon. Um, a little bit of lore drop for, there for you. <laughs> um, and she's a great control piece for us. She's our glass cannon. And then I usually bring Miss Marvel, who is just a workhorse. She does everything you want to in the game. But again, she's very fragile. And Quicksilver, who is our extract grabber. So, so these, for me, right? The one thing I want to stress about Inhumans is there are so many different play styles in affiliation, right? So me, as an, as an Inhumans player who has done recently pretty well in some tournaments, and maybe we'll talk about that in a bit, um, I'm going to have a different play style from another great Inhumans player, Brian Freddy, uh, who is on the Advanced R&D podcast, part of the Gamers Guild. Um, his play style is totally different from mine. He plays a lot more of a controlly play style. And so um, even in affiliation, there's different ways to play it and it's fun. And that's not the same for like web warriors, right? Um, so that's, that's sort of my take. I take these four models. I typically leave, leave these four models at home. When you buy the box for that affiliation, is that who comes with it, those four characters? Or do you have to get them individually or how's that work? That's a great question. So all the Inhumans come in boxes of two. Um, with some exceptions. So the first two, the box that is a must is the Black Bolt Medusa box. They come in a box together, so it's a quite easy pickup. 
Um, they are the best models in the affiliation and the only leader. So that's a box you have to get. Um, Miss Marvel actually comes in a box of her own. Um, so she's actually uh, unique in there. She's one of the exceptions I wanted to bring up. But I think she is um, an essential model. She's a really fun model to put on the table. She has a lot of mobility. She does um, a lot of random things we'll talk about in a bit. But the three with that core three, you could run um, a lot of games. And then you just splash the rest. Um, let's talk about... Oh, and then the second box that's pretty important, I think, is Lockjaw and Crystal. They come in a box together. So that's another great box. So with basically three boxes, you've got an Inhumans team you could run till the end of time. The other characters are a little tougher to get. Quicksilver comes with, I think, Scarlet Witch, because they are related in the Marvel storyline, right? Um, they come together. Scarlet Witch is not a, a affiliated, but Quicksilver is. Beast is another weird one. He comes in a box with Mystique. Beast is affiliated, but Mystique is not. And then lastly, we have Ronan, um, and Ronan is affiliated. Uh, but I believe the person in Ronan's box is not affiliated as well. So um, if you're just looking for your bang for your buck, you definitely want to get the Black Bull Medusa and the Crystal Lockjaw and then the Miss Mark. Awesome. All right. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty and, and really what makes this affiliation or alliance special and, and really why you play them. So I guess we, we start with the, the leader first, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> here's Black Bolt. Um, to just go quickly into why I'm an Inhumans fan, um, you know, you have, have you ever done those um, like quizzes online of like answer these 10 questions and they'll tell you what type of Harry Potter oh, yeah, you know, yeah, house yeah. you're in? So I did one in high school with my buddies and uh, uh, we each did one for Marvel. And so I got Black Bolt. I don't know why. Uh, I guess I was, I guess I was a quiet kid, um, but uh, you know, my friends in Toronto thought I had something important to say. We did all these quizzes together. So I didn't answer any of the qu questions for myself. My friends would have to answer oh, the questions. Oh, okay. So I like that. It was like more of a, a, it was a, it was a cool experiment to see how people see you. Um, and I got Black Bull, a buddy of mine got Hulk because he was like in the gym all the time. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, those kind of roles stayed with us. And just over time, you know, we it's a nickname for each other. Uh, Black Bolt's mine. So I'm a huge Black Bolt fan. Um, I've read a ton of Inhumans comics. Um, I was not a fan of the show. Oh. There was a show out. I was not a fan of the storyline of the show, but I love the actors. Um, I think Anson Mount is amazing as Black Bolt, and to see him in the Multiverse of Madness was really special for me. Um, so that's, that's why I'm bringing Black Bolt as opposed to other leaders. Um, in affiliation, we have to bring him. He is our leader. Um, he was known as uh, as a boat. I think that's I think that's the term that people used to to uh, refer to him as because he doesn't really move much. He stands still. He has a six die energy builder which uh, has pierce, so it's a massive attack. It's really strong. Um, uh, but he doesn't have much mobility on his card. He lacks action compression. We've talked about that on the channel before. He doesn't have charge. He doesn't have hit and run. Um, what is yeah. action compression? I've heard you guys use that term. Can, <laughs> can you explain question. that? Yeah, so action compression, I, I, so it's, I'm glad you asked that question because so many times these terms get thrown out and they don't really get explained for newer players. Um, so action compression means a model has a way of doing more than just attacking and moving or just attacking twice in a turn. Um, and we actually use this to evaluate how a good a model is, whether that's good or not. I don't know if that's a good measure, but um, for example, someone like Baron Zemo, who I have over here. Um, Baron Zemo, he has charge. So he can move and attack in one action, basically, right? Um, and then he's got a whole nother action afterwards to do whatever he wants. He can grab an objective, he can run away, he could attack again. And so effectively, you're gonna get more out of Baron Zemo in terms of like utility than someone like Black Bolt, who is kind of just gonna move and attack or just attack twice. Um, and that's breaking it down very simplistically, but that is what action compression is. 
Oh. I've got one more for you. And I didn't understand if this was like part of like, I'll ask the question, clap back. Yeah. I didn't know if it meant like, I'm going to do this now, but you get activation next. So you're doing that back or if clap back specifically was tied into like an ability, meaning like if you hit me, this character then does X. Yeah. So I think it's used different ways, but I think typically the majority of people understand clap back as like, if your model gets attacked, it's going to be able to do something in response that will deal damage or affect that opponent's turn. Gotcha. So and a good, good recent example of this is um, an unreleased model, Dracula, uh, who we will talk about on the channel in a bit. Um, when Dracula gets attacked, he can spend two power and he can do an attack in response. Um, another version of clapback is actually on Baron Zebo. We just talked about him. He has something called Counter-Strike. So when he gets attacked, he can spend two power, he rolls five dice, and he deals damage based on the wilds and uh, crits. So that's sort of explaining what clapback is. Perfect. Yeah. Continue. So right. we, we've kind of touched on Black Bull. Yeah. And um, so he has to be the leader. Do you, yes. do you think you're going to get any new leaders or...? For sure. There's a been, oh. a, yeah, there's been a huge <laughs> announcement in the, uh, you know, for us Inhuman fans who are waiting for releases for a very long time. Uh, we were blessed by MG at Ministry of Aganza. So we have four mo new models coming out. We've got Maximus the Mad, who is in, um, Black Bolt's brother. Um, we have uh, Gorgon and uh, Karnak, who are members of the Inhuman Royal Family. So like, think like, imagine you're playing X-Men and you only have Wolverine and Cyclops, but you're missing Jean Grey you're missing um, Professor Xavier. You're missing the core components that make your team. We're finally getting them. We're getting Gorgon, we're getting Karnak. Um, I don't think those will be leaders, but Maximus the Mad probably will be. Um, and then we're getting a whole new Black Bolt model who will probably be a leader too, so. Do you think you're gonna change leaderships if either of those? For sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like I'm, I, I'm always theory crafting with this game. I love this model to death, this Black Bolt model. Um, but you know, you play so many games with one leader, you just wanna try out more, you know? So I know you, you kind of went over a lot of the stuff on the card and what he does, but like, can you just briefly talk about what is the favorite thing that he does that you like? And then maybe what's his like biggest weakness that you've noticed? Sure, um, yeah, that's a good question. So actually my favorite thing about him is something new that they added. Uh, he has a bodyguard ability called King of My People. No, it's called A King Serves His People. It is a one power bodyguard, meaning, and that's another term we threw out there, um, bodyguard versus taunt. So a bodyguard model is if there is um, a model within two that is being targeted, you can typically spend model, uh, spend power on the model for a bodyguard ability, which will take that attack, right? The other way, um, Taunt is the other type of keyword that we use sometimes. Taunt means that your model is, is within two of the opponent, typically. Okay. Um, and I'm, I, again, I'm simplifying things. There are bigger distances, but two is typically the distance we see. And so that's uh, my favorite ability on him is a one power bodyguard, which we don't have in the game. He's the only model in the game which can take an attack for one power. There is a tactics card that does that called Sacrifice. Um, and you can only use that once. Black Bolt can do it every single time an opponent attacks. Wow. Yeah. But you did say one of the downsides is there's not a lot of life, so you can only probably do that so many times before you down mm -hmm. him. <laughs> well, yes, but you want him to die. You want him to be dazed because the beauty of Black Bolt is that on his healthy side, sure, he has only six health. On his injured side, oh, on his injured side, uh, he has nine. Oh, he has okay. nine health. Um, and so on his injured side, he gets way more health points. He gets an extra attack called Whisper, which is a huge like beam attack. So Black Bolt's thing is he um, doesn't speak, he can't speak. Uh, because when he does, even if he whispers, he'll destroy a city. His voice is that powerful. And so I really like AMG to sort of, um, for kind of simulating that on the card, right? Like he's not, he's holding himself back, he's holding himself back, but when he gets dazed, and he's on his injured side, he just lets loose. And he just lets a huge beam out. Um, so yeah, so that's probably, 
the bodyguard and the beam are probably my favorite parts of Black Bolt. And my least favorite part, um, it's so hard to break these down, but it would probably be his lack of action compression. I already brought that up, but um, long story short, I don't even think that's a downside for Black Bolt. I think he is um, just a really, really solid model. And I think his lack of action compression is actually a way to balance him because otherwise he would be too good. Awesome. I think that's that's what I've noticed in the game. It's like there's give and takes on everything. I think AMG spends a lot of time clearly developing these cards, play testing them to make sure. And I think that's what makes the game fun. It is well balanced and that's why you can pretty much grab any characters that you like and at least have a chance. Yeah. I do think there are certain characters that have an advantage, just like everything, every type of game. But I do think you can pretty much play what you like in Marvel Crisis Protocol, which is one of the reasons I very much enjoy this game. So Black Bolt, out of the way. Who's the next char character you're probably going to grab or you want to talk about? Yeah, so let's talk about Medusa here. Um, so we'll just move some of this stuff down here. Um, so Medusa is, is, you know, she's queen of the, the Adeline people. Um, and she is essential to our game plan. So she has an ability called Royal Decree, which is a two power ability. If she is within two of an ally... Um, she can spend two and she can jump off that model within one. So what that means is she has action compression. Mm -hmm. And this is limited to uh, once per turn per model, which can be confusing to some people. But what that means is, let's say she's jumped off beast here. She can spend another two power. She can't use it on herself anymore because she's used it. But she can use, let's say, um, Beast. She could take Beast and she could bring him up within one. And then if she had two more power, let's say uh, Ronan is over here, she could be like, hey, look, I, I have two extra power. I'm going to bring Ronan back here. So she has a lot of um, ways of controlling the board. She feels like a queen in chess. Oh, okay. um, she is moving everywhere. She is very deadly. And the opponent wants to take off the board as fast as possible. Um, and maybe that's a good analogy. Um, then humans are probably the closest affiliation to a, a traditional chessboard in, that, in, in sort of the, the roles of the people there. So I guess if people are gunning for Medusa right off the bat, having Black Bolt to be able to kind of take that bodyguard is something you do often, or is that not something that comes Oh, up? all the time. All the time. Um, Medusa has 6 HP, but she only has 3 defense. Um, she has one more uh, defensive sort of ability. It's called Living Strands. Um, she has the power to control her hair. So um, opponents can't re-roll their dice into her. So she has some defensive tech, but at the, at the end of the day, three defense is very low in this game. And if she gets attacked twice, she's probably going to go down. So I'm, I'm always looking for places to position Black Bolt to get in that bodyguard range. And I think players who are playing Black Bolt should always try to be in bodyguard range of key pieces. Um, and that's why I typically put extracts on Medusa because um, I want people to go after her and I want to be able to make it easy for myself to just say, hey, look, I don't feel bad about placing Black Bolt within two for that bodyguard. And then next turn, she can Royal Decree him back. She can go off of him. These are like some ways that you can kind of use the Inhuman. Nice. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, Inhumans are pretty um, complicated for <laughs> an affiliation. You can play them very simply, but they have so much depth to them um, that can be overwhelming to players. Um, to quickly bring it back to Black Bolt, his leadership lets you pass one power per turn. And so there's a lot of thinking that can go into the turn. You can get into what's called analysis paralysis, where you're just like, what do I do? What do I do if I... If I pass power here, this is going to affect next turn. Um, some advice for players out there. Um, just go with your gut. Your first thought is often the, the, the right thought. Um, especially if it's a turn, if it's a pivotal game in a turn, uh, in a game, sorry, if it's a pivotal turn in a game, I think it's important to take maybe a couple extra seconds. But um, you, at the end of the day, we're just trying to roll dice and play against your opponent and your opponent doesn't want to sit there for five minutes with you agonizing over a decision which i know from firsthand experience because i've done that to people so i've i've, I've tried to grow as a player 
and uh, as an Inhumans player as well. If I'm being perfectly honest, I love the cinematics of this game. I love the back and forth. You're down one second, you're up the next second. To me, part of this game is like, if you're a superhero and you're in a battle, you're not sitting there for 10 minutes making a decision. So I'm not right. saying you have to like make a decision as fast <laughs> as your character does, but I think there's like some story, play, like lore, fun tie-in element to playing fairly quick and making it happen. And like, realistically, if it doesn't end up working out, reevaluate and try something different. That's what they would do, right? Like it doesn't always work out, but I think you're gonna stumble onto something that, you know, maybe it works, maybe you find something new, but yeah, I just, I, I don't wanna say I'm a fast player, but, you know, when it's your turn, it's not like Shatterpoint. Shatterpoint's cool where you get that like random activation. You don't know who you have to activate. Right, right. This you can, but I think like, I don't know, pick your person, go with your activations, make your decisions and see what happens. Because at the end of the day, right, you're rolling dice. And I know Jen says it all the time, but dice be dice, right? <laughs> dice be dice, yeah. Your, your, your plan, your well thought out plan could just fall to pieces very quickly if you roll badly. So yeah, at the end of the day, just like pick a model, um, do the thing as Julie says, and um, you know, just roll dice and play the game out because at the end of the day, you're just, even in a tournament setting uh, where you're on clocks, you just, you wanna play quicker. You don't wanna, um, you don't wanna use that clock to your advantage. That was one of the big things about Magic that started to turn me like towards the end of being a tournament player. It's like fetch lands. I mean, yeah. you can't play a game without people shuffling the majority of the time you sit there and play. And Magic Online made it a little bit better because you didn't have to sit through it. But I just always thought that was such a painful thing to have to sit through. And I just, moments like that, I don't think are like feel good moments. Like this game to me, I think one of the things I like about it so much is even when it's not your turn, like you're still, you have to pay attention because you're going to have to react in just a second. So you're never like, out of the game. There'd never really be enough time for you to jump on your phone unless you're playing somebody that is a very yeah. slow player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think a, an easy tip for people too is to think, I mean, it's, it's very simple, but think about what you're gonna do on the opponent's turn. Um, I think a lot of us fall into just sort of the pattern of just like watching what the opponent's doing. But I, I you know, thinking about those options can cut down a lot of the mental tax that you'll have later on and can make up for a much more streamlined, enjoyable, comic book-like game, you know, rather than like a chess-like game. No, I yeah. agree. So Medusa, you touched on her a little bit, so I'm gonna ask you the same question for each character. What do you like the most about her, and then what do you think could be improved? So what I like about her is she's a control piece. Um, she has two different types of displacement. Um, so her builder, like I said, she's a glass can. Let's start with the negatives. She's a glass can. She cannot take multiple attacks. She goes down very quickly and she's prioritized quickly. But the reason for that is because she's so powerful on the offensive side. So she, on her basic attack, which is her builder, she has the ability to attack multiple times. So if she rolls a crit in a wild, she gets something called a flurry and she can do the same attack again against a different character or the same one. So potentially she can attack four times Josh and each time she attacks, she can push people away. So um, it's not uncommon to see Medusa literally change the entire board state on her activation if she gets to go. Um, That's a lot to like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. she's a very impactful piece and uh, it's just so fun playing with her. So what's the downside? Well, like you said, probably the life, right? Yeah. That's pretty self-explanatory. Well, it's the, the life and the lack yeah. of defense and because she's so impactful, she's prioritized really quickly. So, I mean... Um, I forgot we started with that. Yeah, yeah. She, she's not surviving one Thor attack most likely, right? Definitely like, not. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Yeah. All right. Awesome. And so next, I, I want to talk about the newest addition to the Marvel, or sorry, to the Inhumans lineup, Miss Marvel. Um, Miss Marvel is a character I think more people should be playing with. She is often disregarded because she has low health points. She has five health points, five. And she has defensive stats of three, four, three, which are also pretty low. But um, I'll, I'll jump, the, jump the gun here, maybe the, my, top, my favorite parts of her and yeah, least favorite yeah, parts absolutely. of her. My, my favorite parts of her is she's surprisingly um, a big control piece as well um, on her small side. So she has something interesting where she can transform into the big version. So she starts out as a, just a regular high school girl uh, with a, a elastic punch. She can pull people on that. 
And for three power, she can also throw people size two or less or terrain. And so she has a lot of control in her smaller form. And since you're transferring power, it's easier to start pulling and doing the shenanigans early on. Exactly. <laughs> and, and maybe later I'll get into like the, the power sort of regulation that you have to do with humans. But typically, if you have two power on her, you just pass her one more and she can do her ability. Um, and then for another three power, she goes into big mode. And counterintuitively, when she's in her bigger mode, she loses her throw. She doesn't make sense. So she cannot throw dumpster. She can't, she can't do anything other than attack in her big mode. Um, and that was a balancing issue as well. Um, and when you transform in this game, you get to go within one of the small character. You put the big form. And so you can already see that's quite a bit of movement, right? Because of the big, uh, huge base there. Yeah. Um, and then when she's in her big form, she becomes an attrition piece. She rolls five dice, she can reroll three times. Uh, so very consistent damage there. And at the end of her turn, she goes back into being her small teenage form. And uh, even without spending a move action, she's basically moved a medium. So she's a very fun piece and uh, definitely overlooked. Um, is there a big downside? Um, I know you touched on a few things, but like, is there, like, you know, is there, is there a reason you'd consider not putting her on the board? For Inhumans, no. Um, my, my three go-tos are typically these three. Um, outside, of, uh, outside of the affiliation, she lacks power generation. Uh, her, um, she only has a gainer on her small side. And um, she really wants to have six power, like at the start of her turn, which is a lot to ask, yeah. right? So um, she, she struggles a little bit with power gain, but if you're playing her in um, Steve Avengers, uh, first Steve, Steve one. She's also affiliated in Avengers. Um, you only need four power now. Or no, you need five power, sorry. And so it's just like easier to get her there. And uh, the other downside is not having the throw on her big side. It just, it throws you off. Like you don't, you won't realize that until you, unless you've played with her a lot. Cause it's just counterintuitive. You're like, oh, she's bigger. She should be able to throw things still. But no, that's not the case. Awesome. Yeah. Um, next, I want to talk about Quicksilver here. Is that cool? Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, all right, so um, next we'll talk about Quicksilver. Um, so Quicksilver, the reason why I've kind of brought him up before talking about the other more, I don't know, canon in humans, is that Quicksilver is often my competitive piece. Um, so he is my extract. Uh, go-getter and keeper for most of the game. Um, we could talk a little bit about why he's so good, maybe more in depth in a sec, but um, his attacks are, so his attacks are pretty weak, but he is very good at staying alive. He has sort of the web warrior thing where he gets two defensive rerolls and he moves long. So he's like gonna go to a extract, pick it up and hopefully stay alive. And that's typically why I like him. It's funny because I remember when I first sat down and played my first game, it's like I didn't realize that this game was so much about displacement, movement, those little tiny things. So every time I see a long mover now, I'm like, oh man, I really got to pay attention to what they're doing with that dude over there. Yeah, yeah. And, and on the vice versa, playing with a long mover is super forgiving. Because yeah. it's like if you're off by a little bit, like it actually doesn't matter if you're long, right? Um, you can get to probably the other side of the board with two movements. Um, so it's really fun to play with Quicksilver. Um, my favorite thing about him is that, um, uh, well, we'll talk about it, I think, later. I think it's, uh, these guys are, it's, it's easy to talk about them and summarize what they do, but I think going in depth um, on the board and talk about their specifics, I think it's gonna be really helpful to understanding the characters too. Let's do it. All right, cool, all right. So, hey, how's it going? So we're gonna um, talk about Quicksilver's plays um, on a more practical level. Um, and so I, the best way to do this is to show you. I've set up an F extract board. So we've got the extracts here, which are the orange tokens in an F shape. Um, shout out to iWar Games mats, which are pre-marked. Um, and so the, the, your F extracts are gonna be Struggle for the Cube and Spider Infected. Um, both of them, I think, are really good for Inhumans, and this is the reason why, Quicksilver. So, 
This is a little bit more in depth, but um, I wanted to kind of get this video out there so um, you could just have those deeper plays and those deeper analysis and understand where I'm coming from as a new entry, new foray into the competitive scene. So we've got Quicksilver here on deployment. We're gonna set up Black Bolt on deployment. We're not gonna set up the rest of the models. We're just gonna use these two. First turn, you're gonna wanna go with a model that is not Quicksilver. You're actually gonna wanna go with Black Bolt um, or another model, but we know you're gonna be running Black Bolt. You're gonna pass the power with the leadership from Black Bolt to Quicksilver. So from two here to one. So Quicksilver has two. You're gonna go with Black Bolt. Maybe he goes up, he spends the power to pick up an extract. Maybe he goes up and gets an attack off. We don't know. Doesn't really matter for the purposes of this video. Then turn two, you're gonna go with Quicksilver, okay? And Quicksilver will then take another power from another model within three. Let's say there is a Medusa over here. And so Quicksilver will have three power. And that's what we want him to have. So turn two, he will spend two of those powers to use his active superpower Speedster. Um, and this is why we place him in the middle because he can get to the back Fs with, um, no problem because he's got wall crawler. So let's say he moves over here with the free move off speedster. Then he will spend his first action to move towards their back F, get within one. Let's put him here. He spends one power to pick up that extract and then he can move back long to safety. And this is a safe grab on their far back extract it's way more effective on their midline extracts, but um, this is sort of the unique Inhumans play that you can do. I do this all the time in tournaments. It catches a lot of people off guard. And um, if you are an Inhumans player, you should have Quicksilver in your arsenal for this play, okay? So that's sort of the, um, the fun play to do with Quicksilver. Next, we're gonna be talking about uh, Miss Marvel, and we're gonna be doing an in-depth play on her turn zero or turn one, which I think are, is going to improve your gameplay with her. So Miss Marvel, she loves C-shaped maps. So that means she likes Intrusions, which is a 19 point secure. She likes Alien Ship, which is a 17 point extract. And she also likes Legacy Virus, which is a 19 point extract as well. So with Miss Marvel, turn one, um, you're gonna be moving up medium. Um, again, it depends. You're probably going to be using her third or fourth. You're not going to use her last. You're going to use her probably, um, the activation before your last model. Um, she'll move up small and rather than grab an extract because she is so squishy, she's going to try to attack the opponent. Um, and sorry, before you move up, you would pass a power to her. So she'd go from one to two. So she has two power there. You're gonna attack within four. That's the range on her gainer with Morpho Punch. And the reason why this is so important is because, uh, and the reason why she likes C maps is because you can see you can hit anybody who's on that C point no matter what. So you actually have some more distance you can get back to safety. Uh, but for the purposes of this video, we're gonna go over here. We're gonna assume Zemo over here has picked up the extract on his turn. And so you are well within Four. You might even be within three for stealth. Uh, you are indeed. And so you would attack him. You roll four dice and you hope to get a wild. And so you have four dice with one reroll. And if you get a wild, then you pull Zemo towards you. So suddenly, Zemo is closer to your back line. So that last activation, let's say it's Black Bull, he's going to go last. He can get maybe two attacks off on Zemo. But wait, we're not done. Off that attack, you got one power, right? So you have a total of three. So you're gonna use that three instantly to spend three and throw Zemo closer to your back line. And so remember, you can throw through your own model. So you would throw Zemo even further into your back line. So Mr. Black Bolt over here, who started on turn zero, if he has not gone yet, he can attack twice into Zemo and he doesn't need to move. He doesn't need to spend an action to move. So this is just a great 
line of play to play with Miss Marvel. It's huge control. People do not expect it, again, because it relies on you getting a wild. It relies on you passing power appropriately. Um, and so if you're able to do it cleanly, you can get an opponent's model from their back line who is size two or less. She cannot throw size three. Um, quite close to your back line. You just attack them next turn. You kill them. And um, you can go down on points and not be worried about that because they'll be short one model. All right, so that's sort of the gameplay with Miss Marvel there. So we're going to be talking about Medusa plays. And I literally can't even cover the amount of plays that she has and she can pull off because, um, like I said earlier in the video, she is the queen in the chess game. The amount of moves that she can make is almost limitless, even though she, she doesn't have any seeming uh, action compression. But with that royal decree and with some just a little bit of power and a little bit of dice luck, she can rearrange the entire board. So we're not going to be talking about turn two, turn three, turn four plays. Um, what we will talk about is turn one plays on one specific scenario that can apply to other scenarios. Um, so seeing this will allow you to like think about the applications of Medusa on other types of maps. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the um, L map, which is only one scenario in the game. That is Senators. Um, so in Senators, there are six extracts. We're going to assume this is orange for now. Um, there are six extracts, okay? Um, and I'm not going to get into what Senators is. It is a 19-point game, so you could definitely bring Medusa and Black Bolt and Quicksilver into that game. Um, and we're just going to assume this extract was taken. The blue one, the, the opponent took it, okay? Already. So now we have five on the board. We're also going to assume that Black Bolt has gone. Maybe he went second, and he took one extract. And we're also going to assume that Quicksilver has gone already, and he's taken extract. So what this means is you're going to want to go with Medusa on Senators a little later in the game, maybe not last activation, but maybe middle of the line, maybe third activation, because you want your other models to have grabbed the Senators on the back line, on your safe line, and uh, that allows Medusa to get some work off with uh, Royal Decree. So Medusa starts with one power. You have by now had at least two chances to pass her two more power. So I'm going to assume that you only did this once. But if she did it twice, this is actually a really good. So let's, let's actually assume you did it twice. So you went first with Black Bolt. You passed power with the leadership to Medusa. You went second with Quicksilver. You pass the power from someone else to Medusa. So now Medusa has three power on her on her turn. She can use the leadership for the first time on her turn to pass another power off. Maybe that's from another model. Maybe that's the third power from Black Bolt. Or sorry, the second power off Black Bolt. So now she's got four. There's a couple things you can do here. You can move within two of the models. Okay. And she can definitely get within two of the models here, moves here, within two, and here she's within two as well. Um, and then she would spend four power there, to, well, two at a time to Royal Decree, Black Bolt back, and then Quicksilver back. That's a play you could do. Typically, you're not going to be able to, to get that off just because your power is so limited. Um, and so we're just going to assume Medusa has only been passed one power, which is more typical and doesn't put stress on your team. So Medusa has one power. Let's say Black Bull has one power because he hasn't passed it. And you take a third power. Um, so you're starting Medusa's activation. She is within three of an allied model to use that leadership. She takes a power from them. Let's just say it's um, Crystal. Let's just say it's Crystal. She takes a power from Crystal. So Medusa has two power, okay? And so then, what you could do is some interesting play. You have a couple options here. You can move here to be within um, two of Quicksilver, okay? You can then spend two power off her to Royal Decree Quicksilver into one of Black Bolt um, so that Black Bolt, oops, Black Bolt can use his one power remaining to Bodyguard. Um, 
And then you could possibly be in range three of someone if they got really greedy, maybe there's a midline um, secure to get an attack off, which would build more power, meaning she can roll the Kree again. So like I said, the amount of plays you can uh, play with her with a little bit of dice luck and positioning luck uh, from your opponent is limitless. What I like to do with her is I actually like to move up with her within three. Assume he's there. I like to move up, evaluate my options here, and I can even spend two power off her to roll the Kree up here to the midline, which means you can hit their back line, which means you can hit whoever's taken their senator. Let's say this guy over here took the senator. There's a guy over there. Let's say it's Zemo again, uh, punching bag of the day. And you can attack him. If you generate some power, then you can royal decree Black Bolt or another ally who's on this mid extract closer into defense range. So there's a lot of different plays here. I just wanted to go over the most basic ones. And that is just moving up and bringing your guys back into the bubble that is Black Bolt's bodyguard. Okay. That's just one play you could do with Medusa. And I hope that uh, little lesson um, helps you in the future. The next character I want to talk about is Lockjaw, who is the goodest boy. Um, he is probably MCP's um, love child model. Everybody loves Lockjaw. He is, um, he's just a lovable dog uh, who's shown up in a bunch of comics and could teleport people um, insane distances in the Marvel world. So in our game though, he can only teleport models within three. Um, but he's just, he's so awesome, he's so fun. I've got a little bit of tidbit on Lockjaw. So yeah. Shane's been on the channel before. Yep. Uh, absolutely amazing, pillar of the community, wonderful guy. His Lockjaw is painted like a dog that he had that had passed away. Yeah. But if you ever play Shane and you see his Lockjaw, it's extra special. Shout out Shane, thank you so much for all you do for the channel. We love you, man. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, I wish I had Shane's lockjaw model because that thing is painted phenomenal. Um, all right, so uh, lockjaw is really cool because um, my favorite thing about him is just he just he makes the game a lot simpler by providing action compression for your other model. What that means is he teleports your other models up so they don't have to move. Um, and it's just, it's just such a strong ability. We see Lockjaw splashed more often than he is in, in the affiliation um, because he only has a small move and he only has three defense. So what that means is um, he's not gonna be surviving very much if he gets attacked and he's gonna struggle to be a part of uh, fights to be relevant later in the game. But turn one, he's probably one of the best models in the game. Wow, that's a pretty strong statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen him uh, back when Malkith was a tyrant in the game. There was a popular list called Cat Dog, uh, where uh, Malkith rides on a giant saber-tooth tiger, I think. Um, and people would pair him with Lockjaw and just teleport him up. So then Malkith can just like go rampage on the opponent's back line. Nice. Yeah. Um, cool. And then the... Oops. The next model we'll talk about is Beast. Okay, so yeah. I'm trying to play the X-Men, right? And yeah. I, I like Beast as a character, but I don't know why. When I first looked at him and stuff, I was kind of like, I don't know if Beast is going to make my list. I don't know if I'm going to grab him all that much, blah, blah, blah. But every time I use this guy, and every time I really stop and read him, I'm like, how does he not make like the table pretty much every time? Because he's just so good. Yeah, he's a workhorse, right? I like him a lot. I don't know. I just, I, I don't know why I was kind of turned off, but I just, it's so hard to be like, choose any other model other than Beast, especially when you're playing the X-Men. Yeah. Um, and he's just as good in here as he is in the X-Men, okay. right? Um, so Beast, the, the best parts about him is the two power throw. Um, you know, we don't often see two power throws. It's, they're often three power. Um, and his power generation. He is actually surprisingly a good power battery. He gains power whenever he rolls a skull because he has the um, disconcerting yet provocative superpower. Um, and that comes up a lot. You roll a lot of skulls throughout the game, so he's gaining a lot of power throughout the game and he's always power flush. Um, so 
when I bring them in in humans, um, and like I said, I don't bring them in too many competitive atmos atmospheres just right now because the meta has so many energy attacks and Beast only has two energy defense. So he is very susceptible to those types of attacks. Um, but when I'm facing more of um, a physical based team, uh, maybe someone like Web Warriors who have low die physical attacks, I'm definitely bringing in, bringing in Beast. He uh, moves quite a bit because he is a medium base, medium move. Um, and we like to toss around that term a lot. So that typically means then a model can move pretty far. Um, and so he, there's a medium base. What about a regular? Well, regular she's actually a long mover. But it, just for yeah. size comparison, right. if you were to move that, like how much, how much are you really gaining on that medium? Quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem like much, but that's basically the distance between a one, right? And um, if you move twice again, it's considerably noticeable, right? Because um, basically, we'll just move this beautiful Baron of Dice uh, box out, right? Um, it's quite a bit of a distance. Now we're a little bit more than a one away, mm -hmm. right? And so um, this used to be a big deal when Eyes on the Prize was in the game, but um, medium move, medium base means that a model is going to be more relevant. It's going to be more forgiving if you move and you're like, oh, am I in range of this attack? You're, you're probably confident. You're a lot more confident. It's easier to judge the distance, whether that's because the bigger base is just easier to see or, um, you know, it's just practically, it's just more distance. Um, so he's my secure workhorse. If I have a secure out there, he can throw opponents off um, by passing him one power, and then he just stays on it. That's all he does. He doesn't attack very often in my games. He just moves, moves, and throws a guy. And uh, he gets one point. That's basically his role. Nice. Yeah. You should definitely, you should definitely run him in uh, X Men. Oh, he's in my roster for sure. Yeah. I mean, partially because lore alone, how could you not at least have him? You know, he, he's got to be included. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna go on a minor tangent here. The reason why Beast is in Inhumans is because he betrayed the X Men. He um, supported the Inhumans in their conflict against the X Men. And so now the running gag in the Marvel community is that Beast is actually the most evil of all the X-Men. Oh. Yeah, because he supported essentially genocide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's just like a funny... And funny Beast thing. was like thoughtful and well thought out. So why'd you do that, Beast? <laughs> I know, right? Well, I mean, as a new humans player, I appreciate it. But um, I also love the X-Men. So that was, that was sad to see. Um, okay, cool. Tangent aside. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about one of my favorite Inhuman models, um, Ronin the Accuser. Uh, Ronin is a model that is actually one of only two models in the game that can put out the Judgment Condition. And uh, just to remind people what the Judgment Condition does, after you take damage, you put on the Judgment Condition. The Judgment Condition basically says that all the damage you take on that model for an attack, you get no power. So it eliminates the comeback mechanic of the game, which is, you would be like, whoa, that's like broken. That's like mind blowing. Why aren't people playing Ronin more? Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about his downside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, the reason to bring Ronin is he brings judgment. Uh, judgment is an extremely powerful condition. Um, he's the best user of, um, I, don't, I actually don't know the word for this. He's the best model to give out the judgment condition. Okay. Uh, because basically what his thing says is any model, friendly model within three of him that takes damage, then you can spend two power off of Ronin and that enemy model gets judgment. So it kind of creates a bubble, a uh, safety bubble around Ronin where the opponent doesn't want to attack your units. Um, and so that's really cool. So now we have two models. We have Black Bolt here and we have Ronin here, which create effective bubbles that really make the game complicated for your opponent and harder to deal with. And I think that's fun. It allows some people to play with more of a controlling play style, which is really fun, um, rather than attrition. Ronin is also cool because um, he has a comeback mechanic inside of his car called the Accuser. 
So if he is dazed or KO'd, he actually gets to spend zero power and just get a free uh, move and attack off. Wow. Um, which is very, very strong. We don't see any in the model in the game that has that ability. Um, and so it is really unexpected and it's really flavorful, right? Like he's not willing to die. He's like a zombie. He's still going to get you. Um, and he's also cool because he can bring the power gem. Um, there's not many... Actually, in the Inhumans, there's actually no model that can bring a gem other than Ronin. And Ronin can bring the power gem, which means he starts the power phase with three power. Um, which means for Inhumans, he becomes a power battery for us that we could take power off of and give to other models, which is really fun. Um, it also means that with one extra power, he can do his spender every turn. And that is a very fun way to play Ronin. You just toss the power gem on him. He just moves every turn and done his, does his spender every turn. And that's pretty much his, his job. Um, it's fun. That seems powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And his, and his spender's no joke. It staggers and um, uh, it also has an explosive effect, meaning that it could deal damage to other models uh, near the opponent's model. So that's a lot of upsides, but there was a pretty strong but coming. Yes. W what's that but? <laughs> so the but is that he is he only has three physical defense, and he's a very high threat model. So if you put the power gem on him, he's a five threat model with three physical defense. So he's a five threat model with the defense of a three threat model. And so um, he's going to die very quickly. Or sorry, he's going to get dazed or KO'd. Uh, very quickly and um, so that's a big downside to him um, also he lacks action compression and we talked about that earlier with black bolt um, black bolt can get around that because his attack is so strong you actually can use your other models to reposition the enemy models um, closer to black bolt or you might spend two power to bring black bolt up but you're typically not going to have enough power to do that again with Ronin on your team. So uh, it puts you in a very weird position of, do I want to support Black Bolt's attacks this turn or do I want to support Ronin's attacks this turn? And you almost always want to pick Black Bolt and prioritize Black Bolt because he's your leader, he has a, a really strong builder and uh, Ronin just doesn't have that. So that's that's the downsides with Ronin. He's, he doesn't have any, uh, if he gets pushed, if he gets thrown away, he's a very sad boy. Because his attacks only have a range of two, so if he gets pushed, let's say, um, let's say small, right? He gets pushed back here um, to get to an opponent who's over here. He's gonna have to move and then be within two, right? And that person is not like that's on your backside. If they're like over here you can't get to them. You would literally have to spend two actions to go here again, and then next turn, what are they going to do? They're just going to throw them away small again, and then they're going to move again. And so the more and more I play with Ronan, I um, start to realize that he just isn't impactful in my games. He's not as fun because, like, uh, there's going to be turns where you're just spending, uh, you're just moving twice with him. And so... Um, that's why he doesn't make the cut for a lot of people. It's too bad too, because I haven't been around this game a long time, but I haven't seen the gems come into play all that much. So it's like, at first I was like, oh, that seems awesome. I'm glad it's included. But then to hear that there's like kind of such a downside, it's like, who wants to do that? Like you're like that slow boxer that just can't ever catch up to the guy and you're just constantly whiffing. And it's like, that's just not, it doesn't feel good, especially when you're dropping five threat to do that. Right. <laughs> right. And but so, and so I think AMG tried to balance this by giving him more health points um, and giving him a range four attack. But that range four attack doesn't build you any power. It's only five dice, which is pretty low for a uh, four threat already, actually, a four and a five threat, especially for a five threat. And um, it is incredibly reliant on triggers. So you need to either get a wild for the push off that universal weapon. That's this big hammer he's holding out. And you need to deal damage to give them a shock condition. And, you know, those are two things that are incredibly dependent on dice. So he's uh, not seen as a super consistent model in terms of his attacks. Um, but judgment is still a great condition. So he might just like sit back, let his teammates get attacked, throw out judgment conditions. Just you'd be happy with that maybe. So um, that's, that's Ronan. Awesome. Yeah. All right. And that concludes um, 
all of the Inhumans that uh, all the Inhumans affiliated characters. I could go on and on and on about the uh, splashes that Inhumans can bring because our leadership really allows us to splash these really um, power hungry models. But uh, that video would probably be like as long as the apocalypse. Video. So nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, lastly, we're gonna talk about Crystal here. Um, Crystal is, he's, she's just a very popular in humans. She is the wife of Quicksilver in the comics. She's the sister of Medusa. Um, in the Inhuman show, she's like one of the coolest characters. She has the power to control the elements. So Avatar, the last airbender, she's the next Avatar. She's basically like Korra plus. Um, and so I, I really love the model because she's so thematic, right? She's got a uh, physical attack earth shaker that's her earth bending abilities she's got hurricane blast which is her wind ability she's got um, hydrokinesis which is her water ability that's like the, she's throwing water at people at a very high velocity and then she has volcanic snare which um, is her fire bending ability so she really is the avatar in the marvel universe um, what is so great about her so other than thematics um, she is one of the few models in the game that can attack three times per turn. So she gets the two actions attacks as normal, but if she builds up four power, she can actually spend four for elemental onslaught and she can do a third attack. So um, what do you think about that, Josh? That's pretty broken because I haven't heard or seen anybody do that in the game yet. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy because with attacks, numbers matter like again thor's thor's attack these days is just like staggering it's crazy but like i don't know it, three attacks still might not even drop somebody though so it's like it's good to hear and it's nice to have that like advantage but again it depends on what their defense is and stuff so it sounds good but how powerful is it really does it do you think it really ends up paying off or is it really allowing you to sneak like maybe maybe one more damage every other attack through like how, how powerful is it really so honestly it is incredibly dice dependent. That's what um, I figured. <laughs> yeah, she is the OG um, roulette, you know, uh, because each of her attacks only have four dice. Um, and so what we're seeing in the game, and, and why I don't run Crystal anymore, is that a lot of the models in the game are coming out with really strong defensive abilities. Um, and I'm not mentioning what's called power creep. I'm not mentioning it. I said it, but I'm not going to go into further. But there are models in the game like Shang-Chi, Rhino, models that have very strong defensive capabilities that reduce damage in different ways. And four dice just doesn't cut it anymore, I feel, at the competitive level. And she has no way of boosting these dice. She does have one reroll baked into her card, so she is gonna be pretty consistent, but all her attacks are only four dice and they all come with wild triggers on them. So She's literally there for people who like to just roll a ton of dice and just let, you know, Lady Luck do her thing. Um, and she's fun. Like, don't get me wrong. She moves long. She attacks three times a turn. She could push people. She can stun people. She could slow people. She can incinerate people with her avatar-like abilities. But um, getting them is another matter because it's down to dice. And dice be dice. And dice be dice. So, it, I mean, you brought up the good point. Are they going to be left on one? Yes. My experience with her is I attack a model, especially a model like Shang-Chi or Rhino, um, and I attack three times, and they still have half their health. <laughs> and so I'm like, dang, this feels bad. That, that does feel bad. Yeah. But other times, and here's the other side of things, I've used Crystal, and she's like, Wham, Hydrokinesis, you're slowed, Web Warrior. Bam, you know, uh, Volcanic Snare, you're incinerated, and it's a beam, so then I kill another dude, and then I'm going off, and I'm doing um, her Hurricane Blast, pushing off, another, and she's just like, whoa, this, this one model has like, changed the entire course of the game. Like, she's really fun. Maybe I pop off, I roll a bunch of crits. You know, so she's, she's got that push and pull more than, so than most models in the game, and in Inhumans, she's your gambling model. 
Um, when I said I was going to play X Men, I remember Jin saying that like Wolverine, he was a slot machine, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing this is the slot machine right here. The it sounds like. slot <laughs> machine. There's no other model in the game that's as dice dependent as her, and 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 you know it's going to reward those people who really want to go for the for the big gamble. Awesome. All right, so we've touched on the main characters that you wanted to kind of hit on, but is there any honorable mentions or other characters that we should consider for this affiliation? There are. A lot. <laughs> the one I'm going to mention is what I like to call the Brian Freddy special. <laughs> um, shout out to Brian Freddy. So there is an Inhumans player who cracked the code of one of the best splashes in Inhumans. And this was done at last year's Nashcon in 2023. A player by the name of Brian Freddy, who is now a, I'm going to say world renowned Inhuman player. Um, he's number three on the Longshanks board, if you're on there. Um, he brought a character called Black Cat after she got changed. I believe this was after she got her card changed by AMG. Um, why this model is so good in Inhumans is this model really struggles with power generation. She um, only has four dice on her um, basic attack. Uh, it's range two. Um, and she has two fantastic superpowers that she's going to be using as much as she can. And so typically, she's just really power starved. You can't get all the, um, you can't get, you can't do all that you want to do with it. In Inhumans, you can. not So the world is yours in Inhumans. Uh, with just passing her one power, she can do her spender, Troublemaker, which is a range three attack, auto stagger. You don't have to do any damage, you just automatically stagger an opponent. Um, that seems pretty powerful. It's, it's incredibly <laughs> powerful, and she could do it twice in a turn if she has four power. So you're, you're basically removing activations from your opponent. Wow. Yeah. And um, the buck keeps going here. The buck doesn't stop. She, on that troublemaker, she's got elusive. Uh, so if she rolls a wild on those six dice, she can move small. So what she can do is she can potentially stagger two different people and move away. Um, and so like you feel like you're doing everything with her and then your opponent is very sad the next couple <laughs> turns. Um, I feel like there's not even a butt coming with this character. Like she's just a good splash. She's just the best. Yeah, I think she, in my opinion, she is the best splash. And we really have Brian Freddy to thank for that because people weren't really looking at this model um, outside of her steel but I think her spender has been unlocked within humans. Um, and then, yeah, like everybody knows Black Cat is great. Everybody knows she's one of the top, probably top five models in the game and definitely uh, in contention for the best three threat model in the game. She's a long mover. She doesn't, uh, when you attack her, you can't reroll. You can't count your crits. Um, or sorry, you count your crits, but you can't explode your crits. Um, so she's incredibly tanky. Surprisingly, for having five health and three defenses, she's incredibly tanky, and um, she's also super mobile. And she has something called Cat Burglar. Uh, so for three power and an action, she can take your extract. No roll required. Wow. Yeah. So she's a great model in the game, and probably the best um, splash for us. Nice. Yeah. All right. Now we're on to tactics cards. All right. Um, we're actually only going to talk about a couple. Um, all right, well, the ones we don't talk about, what are you bringing, though? What makes your 10? Let's start with that. Okay, yeah, so what makes my 10? Brace for Impact makes everybody's 10. It makes my 5 every single game. I don't leave home without it. Um, there is just so many throws in the game where it's going to be relevant at any point. Even if you're facing a team that has one or two throws, it's going to come up. So Brace for Impact is always in. Next, I always take Fallback. Um, this card is now restricted, um, but it used to not be restricted, so you'd always have to take it. Now there's a little bit of a contention. It's like, do I take fallback or do I take another restricted card like sacrifice, which lets you bodyguard for one power on each model? But from in my opinion, I think fallback is the better card. It, you know, I, I've talked about these models having bubbles and sort of like wanting to be close to each other for the leadership, and fallback. And, and about how squishy my, our models are, right? Most of these models have five HP. And so what fallback does is it allows you to take one attack when you get targeted and you spend two power 
and you can get it, you can move back and hopefully be outside of range of the second attack. So uh, that's sort of the two cards I always take no matter what. Thirdly, I've always been taking Recal Matrix recently. Um, th this, this just started maybe in the last three tournaments that I've uh, done. But in those tournaments, I've placed second in two of them. And the third, in the third one, I'm currently five and one. So this card has saved my life so many times. Um, I use it defensively pretty much only. So you have to say your opponent rolls four crits and ends up with eight dice. And you're just like, have four dice. And you're like, okay, I die here. Why not? Let's just have them re-roll. And what I found is 50% of the time, you will survive that attack. Just because dice be dice. Yeah, that's you know? big. Yeah, so I love that card too. And so then what that means is for Inhumans, we typically have two spots that are open. Um, and so I'll talk about four cards. Four cards about that. But let's talk about some more cards that would make my 10. Okay, so Warpath, um, one power. If you take a damage, you move towards the uh, opponent's character small. Simple, nice movement shenanigans. Uh, we talked about Ronan earlier getting pushed back. He's very unhappy and sad. This card makes him less sad because okay. he can get back into position. Uh, Join Effort is also a card that makes my 10. Um, Join Effort is a card that lets you get more dice on attacks if, if everybody's kind of scrunched up together. So on maps like E, where everybody, like, let's say like it's, a, it's a rumble, you know? Maybe it's a rumble in, in the jungle, you know? There's like five dudes in the middle and they're all bashing each other within two. This card is gonna allow you to add like maybe six extra dice to one attack. Wow. Which is, so it's just like, it's really fun. So you get a Thor attack for one? <laughs> yeah, basically I get to become Thor for a turn. I know I keep referencing that, but he's new and everybody that was talking about him at the last turn I went to was just like, this is outrageous. Like this guy is strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's so strong. They had to nerf him. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, right? <laughs> and he's still a beast. So that's a great card I usually take. Um, and then um, an honorable mention goes to cards that are character specific. So um, cards like Chi Mastery. If I'm running Shang Chi, right, I'm probably going to bring him car bring his card, and that's going to make my ten. So um, for simplicity's sakes, uh, it just depends on which splash characters I'm taking, and I typically take a card that is associated with them, and that makes my ten usually. But then let's talk about the Inhuman specific cards. Uh, first, we'll talk about Inhuman Royal Family. This card often makes my five um, because it is a mini recalibration matrix for your entire team of Inhumans. Uh, so for two power, you can uh, put a token on an Inhuman character and that inhuman character can reroll one attack or one defensive uh, roll this round. Okay. So it's really fun. It, it allows you to, it, it gives you more consistency in your um, attacks and defenses. And the one thing that inhumans are known for is for being that mid range team that's very consistent. Almost all of the inhumans have a reroll of some kind. And so they make, um, they make bad dice stays a lot less frequent. And that's why I really like Inhumans as well. Like, you're always going to have a good time playing them because, um, you know, you're going to have less of that bad dice luck. Um, so Inhuman Royal Family always comes. And I'll talk about its uses. I typically play it turn three or turn four and only on one or two models. So rather than pay two power for my whole team, if even if I have it, there's some models where it's just not relevant. A model like Quicksilver, his attack is only four dice. Um, Rerolling four dice is not going to really be that useful. And on defense, he already has two rerolls. So I don't need another reroll on top of that. So he's typically good. But on a turn three Black Bolt, if I'm in position of someone, he's got six dice. What if I crit once? I got seven dice. And what if those dice flub? Well, this makes it so that seven dice will probably be relevant, right? Yeah. So I use this to basically say, okay, uh, your model, I'm going to delete them off the board now. 
Nice. Yeah. I feel like that's got to be like the biggest feel bad moment of this game when you roll a big attack and hit nothing and you're just like, I just rolled like seven to 10 dice. Like how, like how, <laughs> you know? It, it and it is. happens, it, it happens is. often. Yeah, and I think we should have maybe a future video where we talk about like um, player approaches and expectations, right? Uh, because it's so easy to tilt uh, and feel bad. That's a term we use when we like get that bad dice luck and we're just like so down in the dumps for the rest of the game. We just like give up. And I think even if you roll bad with a little bit of changed perspective and lesser expectations, you can have a good time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it's funny because it's people consider it a negative, but really if you're stuck in the thematics of the game, you're gonna have a superhero that had like this great drop on another one that did something and it just doesn't work out. Like that's yeah, that's how it's it works. Thematic. You're yeah. Right. It really is. And it's that's I can't even tell you how many games, well, I've only played a few games, but like where you think somebody's basically won. I mean, it's like, you're like, wow, I'm way ahead. And by the next turn, you're like, I've lost this game. Like how this, it's yeah. very swingy, but that's how a superhero battle would be. Like if one superhero walked in and just beat the other one up, like that's not fun or exciting. That doesn't happen in these battles. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, more so than most other games, Marvel Crisis Protocol gives you that comeback mechanic. And it is the dice as wild as they can go um they're the great equalizer so like someone who's playing with uh, incredible skill um you still have a chance even if you're like a moderately new player you still have a chance to beat them if dice go your way um and so like that's why i love and it's thematic right it makes sense like sometimes peter parker can just straight up beat these multiverse you know multi-dimensional beings you know um i love that you know Right. Yeah, the underdog. All right, so then, and then we'll talk about my favorite tactics card in the entire game. Literally in the entire whole game, this is my favorite tactics card. It's Terra Genesis. It's an inhuman-only card. Here's the card art. It's beautiful. Um, inhumans, you know how X-Men get their powers through mutation? Mm -hmm. Inhumans get their powers by going through something called Terra Genesis. So there's a gas that comes out called the Terrigen Mist. That's created by breaking crystals. It's kind of weird. We're not going to go into the lore of that. <laughs> but certain humans, when they have the genetic disposition and they make contact with that mist, they enter into what's called pterogenesis and they enter into these like crystal rock formations and they come out, they enter in cocoons and they come out butterflies, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the lore dump there. Um, this card is great. So it's an active superpower, and humans only can use it. They spend three power, and you target a character within three that has a civilian extract. Um, and then you just, this is the slot machine. You roll four dice for every hit, crit, or wild, you deal one damage. Um, and if you manage to daze or KO that model, you instantly get two victory points. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, they reward you for the big gamble and that opponent's going to be dazed, so they're going to drop their extract towards you. Um, and typically, you know, this would be out, but typically then you can go pick it up. So it's, it's, uh, it's you know, it's a cool card because, it, it, you know, if you do the MCP special where you leave someone alive on one, this is the perfect card to play. I was literally just going to ask you, is this something where it's like if somebody's got a, a higher like life that you're going to try to attack and go bigger after them that way? Or is this an Alive on One? Alive on One is a phenomenal podcast. Our buddies over in Maine make it. They've come down. They've done some battle reports. Link in the description below. Alive on One. Check them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, you use this when an opponent has one or two life. You never take the gamble if they have three or four life unless you're gonna lose the game 100% guaranteed. And as we just talked about, your loss is never guaranteed in Marvel Crisis Protocol. So yeah. you're almost always gonna use it on one and two. And uh, if you roll and end up rolling zero dice success, it's okay. You took the gamble, there was no downside other than three power, that's it. Those two victory points aren't nothing either. No. I So many games I've seen, Somebody needs two points to win the game. So that's just like a sneaky gotcha. You know? Yeah. And if you do it when you have 14 points, you win the game instantly. No, that's what yeah. I'm saying. I think that's just so yeah. powerful. I mean, that's something I'll have to be cognizant of when I play in humans in the future. Like, yeah. 
paying attention to the points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, watch out for that because we'll, we'll, we'll get you. If I'm not mistaken, this is the guys you used when we played against each other? Uh, yes. I think you so. had a care. Yeah. Oh, actually, no. So it was, uh, I was going to say it was uh, Ronin because you, you yes. had done an attack and you're just yeah. like, now you can't activate that character. And I was like, what? Like, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think I put a stagger on to Hulk. Yep, yep, and, you, yeah, and, it was. Uh, that felt bad. Yeah. It was the first time I got to use Hulk, too. I remember that specifically. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, I shouldn't have done that. No, um, you gave me a great game. Like, I had no business even being at the table. We had so much fun, though. Like, that was awesome. No, dude, that was, that was a really fun, memorable, memorable game, for sure. Nice. Um, so last, last two cards, I know I'm, like, inundating you guys with tactics cards and knowledge, but I think this is really important. We'll talk about Quicksilver's card here. Can I borrow that? Very simple card. It only works on assets. Oh, yeah, we'll add this here. Terra Genesis only works on civilians. So it does not work on asset uh, extracts. So you wanna be, it's a thematic way of playing the game, right? So extracts um, can come as either civilians or assets. And so Terra Genesis would only work with civilians. This card, can I borrow that, only works with assets. And so what that means is that when Quicksilver deals damage, he can spend two power, and he says, give me that, and it's his now. And uh, that's it. It's as simple as that, and then he can go run away. Nice. Yeah, so it's a cool stealing card, which is very fun to play, and you should always bring it if you're playing an asset and if you're playing Quicksilver. Lastly, we'll talk about last minute save here. This card is really cool. Um, it's not the most popular card, um, but it allows your dog, Lockjaw, to save your critical piece. So let's say you have your leader. Let's say you're playing um, X-Men, right? And you splash Lockjaw. And Professor Xavier or Storm or Cyclops are bound to go down. They're getting dazed. You're like, oh man, there goes my leadership. There, oh man, the game's going to be lost. You can spend three power with Lockjaw. Um, and as long as Lockjaw's within three, that character is not dazed. It goes to one health point. Um, alive on one. And alive on one. <laughs> this is literally, this card should be on the logo of Alive for One's podcast. Because <laughs> um, that's what it does. It just makes you alive on one. Awesome. Yeah. That seems pretty powerful too. Yeah, it's super powerful. But it's, it's, it's less popular just because in the game there's a lot of ways to deal one extra damage. So um, you do that and you feel really happy. And then they throw some building into him, you know, like that's that's the way it goes. So with that, that concludes all the tactics cards for the Inhumans that I typically take. Awesome. And yeah. what missions are you grabbing when you play? Yeah, um, I am usually running civilians uh, because of Terra Genesis, right? I love that card so much. So my, I always take scrolls, which is a 20 point extract. Um, and I always take... Spider Infected, which is a 17-point extract, which is civilian. Um, and then I typically take Senators, too, uh, which I talked about in the, in the Medusa portion, but um, that's a 19-point extract that's a civilian. There's only three civilian extracts in the game right now, um, and I stress right now because they're going to come out with a cool pack of, uh, of Crisis cards very soon. But um, those are the three extracts that I usually take. And then um, there are some honorable mentions. So there's Legacy Virus, which is 19 points. I really like that. It's on a C shape. I also sometimes take Alien Ship, which is also on C shape, which is 17 points. So uh, that's sort of my answer for that. Nice. Um, and then for Secures, sorry, for Secures, um, this this, the Secures really depend on your play style. Like really the Crisis depend, depend on your play style, right? Um, you can play with any uh, because Inhumans are such a mid-range team, you can play on any Crisis combo and feel okay and have a plan for that, right? They're the jack-of-all-trades. They're the, like the Swiss Army knife of the game. Um, so for Secures, it really comes down to personal preference. Again, for me, um, I like playing higher point games, um, but I really don't like Scoundrels, which is the 20-point one, because uh, Black Bolt's not that good on it. So I play something like... Um, I'll play Mutant Madman, which is on a B-shape. Uh, Infinity Formula, which is on a B-shape. Um, I know a lot of Inhuman players like playing on Gamma, which is on an E-shape. It's 15 points, which is the downside, because um, in Inhumans you want more models to have more power to pass around. But um, 
uh, you know, the, the, we love the E-shape, so we don't have to move as much, right? And we talked about, like, we don't really have much movement shenanigans outside of Medusa. So um, those would be my suggestions. Um, and shout out to Intrusions, which is a 19 point um, secure that Miss Marvel especially loves. Um, she's really good on it because she can interact with things with them too. So it's a lot of info dump there, but um, those are a bunch of suggestions that I would use to start off thinking about what crisis you want to go with. Awesome. Is there anything else you think you should add or any honorable mentions or any last things you want to touch up on in humans? Yeah. So, um, I know this video is going quite long, so I, you know, I, I hope we keep this in. And this is my my apologies to you guys as the viewers, but I, I think I've thought a lot about Inhumans, and um, I think this next part is super important to understanding Inhumans and leading to a very fun gameplay experience, and that is power generation and range calculations. So I'll start off with the range calculations. Because our leadership only works within a model within three, we are always thinking as inhuman characters, okay, how do I end, like, get an attack in and end my movement so I'm within three of another model so I can pass power and do my abilities? And I think that can lead to a lot of mental taxation. And so when you play the game, you're like thinking so much, it's like 40 chess, you know, cue that meme, you know, where all the numbers are coming, you know, all the numbers and shapes. Um, and I just want to say you don't have to think that much with Inhumans. Um, you're going to miss a couple triggers. And I had to learn this the hard way is that um, to not burn out on the affiliation, I think it's, it's okay to think really strategically in the first couple turns. But afterwards, just measure very, like, simply. Um, you know, if you have a three tool out, you know, rather than just trying to get the perfect measurement of a three tool like here or here, you know, you, you can put a model a little bit in and you know you're within three no matter what. And you're just, you know, you're just going to have an easier time. The game's going to go quicker. It's going to be easier for your opponent. Um, <laughs> your opponent's not going to have to wait as much. And so it's going to cut down on your mental tax. So you can spend that mental power and that time thinking about more other plays, you know, maybe talking with your opponent. That's always a fun thing to do. <laughs> right. That's my favorite thing. I said it in the, the last update video. My favorite thing is who are you and what are we doing here today? Yeah. And, and you can get that in Marvel Crisis Protocol, you know, um, even in tournaments. So uh, that's that's my little um, talk about mental taxation and then power generation. So in Inhumans, the other mental taxes, you're always like, OK, how do I have enough power to do all these things, you know? If I'm passing power from, from one model to another, you know, sooner or later, I'm going to run out, especially turn one. I have a finite amount. Um, so what I like to do to lessen that stress is I like to just plan out my turn zeros before I even play a game based on my crisis selections. Um, and this video, I have those in-depth analysis, which will be like shortcuts for you. Just copy them. Like literally, you can copy the position of the characters on the board. Uh, well, that's not true because <laughs> the, the, the board shape might be different and the characters might be different. But, you know, um, you could feel free to copy the power management and just uh, those plays are like easy, like football plays. You it's know? the concepts there. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So so that that's basically it. And, you know, um, we value models that generate multiple power per turn. And so that that also lessens the mental tax so that sometimes you just bring Ronan with a power gem because he just makes everything so simple. You don't have to think about gaining power and you know, you can just be like, oh, he starts with three. I'll just give one power to black, one power to Medusa, one power to um, Quicksilver and they can do all their abilities, you know, so um, just shout out to that as well. Awesome. Well, Eric, I want to thank you for coming down and taking your time to help us out. And again, I think yeah, we want to be cinematic. We want to show the game off in a cool way. But I want people to always learn something when they get to watch these videos. So yes, it's long, but I would expect people when they're painting or they're hobbying, throw it on in the background and, you know, kind of get to learn a little bit about it. So thank you. I want to thank Baron of Dice because they help out with the channel. They send us super cool dice to help out and make the battle reports look that much better. So if there's any affiliation that you have that you like, head on over to Baron of Dice and check those guys out. And lastly, I'd like to thank iWarGame because, as you mentioned earlier, 
pre-marked maps make the game a lot simpler to set up, a lot less confusing to measure out and go through that, and I think it just makes the overall experience so much better. The quality, absolutely top notch. I was talking to those guys, they're getting a big restock and some new stuff coming in shortly, so the link to their website's in our description below as well. Awesome. Is there anybody you'd like to thank or shout out? Um, you know, I would like to shout out Josh here. I know, seriously, this, I mean, he is so humble, but he puts in so much time and effort into these videos. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't get a chance on the camera to say it with <laughs> you here. So thank you again for all the time you put into editing and, you know, inviting us out and hosting us. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but like we are in a space that Josh has curated um, and with um, terrain over here that he's painted. Um, and so, you know, thank you again for setting this all up and, and inviting us out. Yeah, like I said, the reason I set up to do this, I, I wasn't doing this for me. I wanna make a community. I want people to have a place that they can go hang out and, and learn from, you know, whether it's physically, you guys are coming down and playing with us, rolling dice with us, or you guys are learning from us, watching the videos. I mean, again, we, we're gonna try to bring more people on to do some more talks. We're gonna expand, we're gonna touch on some other games and um, we're just gonna try to have fun and, and build a better knowledge base. And I think what you did today, as far as showing those plays, I haven't seen anybody else do that. So I think the viewers are gonna like that. So thanks for your time, Eric. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it, man. Take care.